Jenna, isn't this when we said that we were going to do the, that we were going to record the podcast? Yes, it is, Dave. Do you have any idea where Mark is? I do not. Oh, hey, hey guys, sorry I'm late. Had to get Cat our guest for today. <clears throat> Mark, we're, the person we're interviewing's name is Cat. We're, we're not interviewing an actual cat. Oh, oh my God. Okay, well, I was wondering what we we're going to ask her. <laughs> Yeah, Mark, today we're interviewing Kat Weiss, who is a community organizer at, the, at South of Downtown and is an, also a local Lincoln artist. Um, Kat has had many opportunities to use her artistic talents to start dialogues and advocate for social change in her community. We're not interviewing a cat. Man. Yeah, honestly, this sounds a lot better. So, yeah, so I'll have to without... take that cat back to the alley, but <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, without further ado, uh, let's get into our conversation. All right, so we are here with Kat. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, how are you doing today? I'm great. I'm great, thank you. How are you? We're, we're, we're doing well. We're, we're just trying to survive the, the, the daily monotony of, of, uh, of, of the coronavirus world, so but we're, we're doing great. So yeah, so if you could just kind of start off by giving us a little bit of your background and kind of how you got into art and what kind of art you like to do. Yeah, so I am from Lincoln, born and raised. I graduated from the university in 2018, and right before I graduated, I started working for a nonprofit called uh, South of Downtown Community Development Organization, and I started working as a community arts organizer, which is literally the perfect job for me because when I was in school, I was really passionate about using art as a vehicle and in some ways uh, to talk about social justice and think about um, identity and race and um, colorism and some of these ideas that I was thinking about in my own life as a multiracial black woman. Um, so I've been making art really forever, um, but I wasn't making the kind of work I'm making now until I was probably uh, maybe like 17 or 18 and I started asking questions like, who am I and, and what does it mean to be me? And what do all these experiences I've had as a young person um, mean? I wasn't somebody who was really talked to about my identity. My mom is African American and my dad is white and I think they thought the best thing they could do for me was to not talk about it. And so I was never really um, able to process my own experiences until much later when I realized, oh, like someone calling me blackie for two weeks in high school, like that was racism. That was someone being prejudicial towards me. Um, so yeah, like that's really where my work is functioning out of now is sort of processing um, how race functions in society today and what it means for people. I recently began uh, making work in, in the public forum uh, as I was looking at what was happening in the world and sort of the necessity of having images of black people in public of having images of brown people um, outside and having these statements that I'm making, not just in a gallery to be consumed sort of by the gallery goers, but to be looked at and understood by uh, the public. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so how, have, how has art kind of helped you find your identity and kind of forge that for yourself? Yeah. That's such a great question. I like that question because as a, as a person who has always loved like pictures and images, my ability to understand myself, um, it started in school definitely as far as like my racial identity when I was in classes and I realized that um, actually, actually that's not even true. Of course I have a family and like I had some early experiences but outside of classrooms where I was in like an all black space and we just talked and like that was probably a pivotal moment for me. But beyond that, it was like in classrooms and then also uh, looking at books of artists and looking at images and finding power in them. Like this here is one of my favorite paintings behind me. This is a podcast, so I will tell you what it is. Um, <laughs> this is a painting that's actually at the Sheldon that I've been seeing since I was 12 as a local like as a, a Lincoln native um, it's by Barclay Hendrick Hendrix it's called Angie and on her shirt is the word slave and you no one's ever seen anyone look less like a slave or look more autonomous or just independent and badass so I love this image uh, for that reason 
for some of those reasons. And so like seeing these images by black artists really uh, inspired me and made me feel really proud to be a black woman and made me really excited to explore all that that means. And so uh, I made work even in reference to this painting. I'm gonna screen share. I'm just gonna do it. I'm just gonna start screen sharing. <laughs> that sounds great. The yeah. picture I'm talking about. So this is my That's website, catweese.com, K-A-T-W-I-E-S-E.com, if you wanna check it out. And I will show you the painting I'm referencing. Um, but there's this sort of conversation that happens between art and in art history, between artists. And now we're at a point in time um, where I can reference artists that were making work in the 60s and the 70s, and not just um, like Renaissance painters and stuff like that. Or um, like now there's a history of black artists that I can look back on and reference. And that's something I really enjoy doing. Um, so this is the painting I was referring to, where it's a sort of abstraction of this painting by Barclay Hendricks. And it's looking at art as an object, as an object, and sort of thinking about the objects that were important to me, as I began to explore my own identity as a black woman, and as I began to think about my own family history. Um, so this little pick is something I stole from my mom for many months so I could paint it. Uh, this is a hat that my friend gave to me at an art show, um, a button I got in a history class, um, a pomade that is aestheticized to look like it's from the 70s, and it's totally not. Um, this is a shower cap. And, and so there's just all these um, objects that just speak to me of like woman, black womanhood. So, yeah, I can't remember the question. But that's my answer. <laughs> no, that that's totally okay. Um, and yeah, it's 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 really it's really awesome to hear about how your how your experience have shaped your art, and, and I think that's really cool. How would you describe your style as an artist? Then, Ooh, that's a good question too, because um, I think we're in a moment right now with the amount of content that's online where there's so many styles at play and that people are exposed to on a daily basis. Um, you can have like so many styles of art sort of at play within a single piece. Um, I think that's really evident in a recent work I did that Jenna asked me to talk about a little bit, which is called uh, When the Sunrise and the Sunset Look the Same. And it's called uh, West, because that's where the sun sets. <laughs> um, and there's like spray paint in the background and then the figure in the foreground is like a highly realized image of a black man with his hands up. And then there's a sort of like rough, um, like writing that's just dripping. And so it's this really tight sort of realism mixed with um, street, street art uh, mediums and then uh, like graphic text. So it's all those things sort of mixed together. Um, Postmodernism, the big question, like what even is postmodernism? If you're an artist, you might, yeah, we don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and that was the piece outside same music you were just talking about, correct? Yeah. Here, I can show you guys um, that as well. Let me yeah, pull that, that up. Good. Yeah, that'd be sweet. Um, yes. I also, I have a blog where I'm trying to write more about the work that I'm making. It also helps me as an artist because so often I'm making work and I'm not really, there's like this impulse about the image that I want to see and I'm not always sure why I have that impulse. And so this image is of um, my friend Marcus who I painted um, and he's sort of posing as uh, Ahmad Arbery who was, <sighs> story is just really hard. He was hunted down in his own neighborhood by his neighbors who were two white men um, who believed he was uh, a robber in the neighborhood who like robbed a house recently and so uh, he, he's running on like a regular jog and they get in the back of a pickup with like guns and they shoot him and of course this is like extremely traumatic to even hear about let alone like there's video footage of this happening. And I was thinking about this sort of um, requirement black people have to be excellent because otherwise you're assumed to be like a criminal or you're assumed to be sort of like 
subhuman in some way. And I've experienced this even like I'll be wearing one outfit and I'm treated decently and then I'm wearing like camo and the next second like people are steering around the street from me. And so um, this sort of like requirement to be better than the next mediocre white person, um, if I'm frank. And so I think about even in Ahmad's pursuit of that, even on his jog, um, where he's trying to better himself, he's not safe. There's really not a context in this country where black people are safe. So that's what that work is about. And then it's a part of a, a diptych where um, this, this one's like the sunset, so it's sort of a representation of death. And then the next image is a sunrise. And it's an image of my friend who's also a pastor, like in a, in, he's not in a church, but he's wearing like his, uh, his Saturday uh, suit and he's wearing the, these clothes. And um, it's, it's a, be they're both like beautiful images, but that one's also, it's like uh, black people have been shot in churches also for generations. So where are black people safe? Like it's kind of part of the question of the work with that one. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, that was at Sandy's. And I can talk more about like that whole process of how it happened as well. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great if you if you want to go into that. Yeah, so Sandy's invited uh, some of their friends after uh, the protests, some of which became violent towards properties. They um, boarded up their windows and then they invited some friends to come and paint the front of them. And I was just driving by and I was like, I really need to pull my work outside because it, can't just be hanging out in my studio, like hiding, you know what I mean? And so I was driving by and I saw like all these four foot by eight foot giant uh, pieces of protest art. And I was like, that looks like an opportunity for me to kind of bring this thing that I've been making in my studio into the public. And so I just walked in and asked if I could paint it. And I showed them a drawing of what I was planning and they were really supportive and they offered me like some materials to paint and I had my own materials luckily because I had a friend who found out what I was doing and sent me like $70. So I really felt like a lot of the community uh, was really supportive and um, Sandy's is actually donating all of the panels um, with the artist's consent to the Malone Center and the Black Leaders Movement Art Auction, which is ending tomorrow. So you can purchase that. Uh, the Nebraska History Museum actually is collecting protest posters and art and they're bidding on it. And I hope they get it because I love the Nebraska History Museum and the way they're trying to archive this moment in civil rights history, mm -hmm. like it's powerful, so. That's so cool. Could you kind of talk about your contribution to um, the, is it Black Lives Matter or is it the Black Leaders Movement Lincoln Art Auction? So the Black Leaders Movement is trying to start a chapter of Black Lives Matter here in Lincoln. Okay. Black Lives Matter is its own national organization. Okay. Yeah. I saw I saw BLM art auction. I wasn't sure. I wanted to use the right um, the right word, but um, could you kind of talk about your contribution to the auction? Just your art pieces that are there, and then yeah, I guess just whatever else you had to do with that. Yeah. So I sort of um, shared that, that the uh, piece of Ahmad that's like referencing Ahmad. So that's up for auction. And then I made another piece uh, called All Black, a portrait of Dwight Brown. It's a three foot by two foot uh, wood cut. So I carved a piece of wood and I went over to Constellation Studios, which is um, run and up and owned by Karen Koontz. Uh, she's such a good printmaker. She's also a professor at UNL. Um, and I'm just honored to have ever like been a student with her because she has had a huge impact on both the local art community and like globally as a printmaker. She really pioneered um, some ways of doing woodcut and handling color. So yes, I love her. But the background on this is um, stripes. And so it's actually a multi-layer print where I carved the figure. And then um, the background with the stripes is a uh, second block because I'm really trying to experiment with like colors and stuff. Uh, but for this run of the print, it's just black and white. So it's all um, black stripes on white paper. And then you see on this shirt, the text, all black. And I'm really excited about this piece because of the way it, um, 
is really about collaboration in many ways, even though um, I'm sort of the artistic vision behind it. My friend Dwight actually made that shirt and he embroidered those letters on it. Um, and he's wearing a, peer, a pair of earrings that I made um, that he like loves these big tassel earrings. So he actually asked me to uh, bring him some. And so I just really celebrate the way he lives in his body, like with his crop top and his tassel earrings and his just like unabashed blackness. Like it's just really refreshing to see that. And also he's a multiracial person like myself. So he's Puerto Rican and African American. And in conversations I had with him before we made um, this, this piece, he was talking about the way um, being uh, Hispanic and being um, Latinx and, and, and how the identity has sort of been something that's challenging for him where people sort of pressured him like not to wear his hair um, in an Afro or not to like show his curls because he was uh, more readily accepted into um, like his Puerto Rican roots that way. And so he talked about that pressure to really like not be black and not look visibly black and sort of hide that part of himself. And I think as, as multiracial people and particularly as someone as light as I am, I could easily like straighten my hair and pass for something else or, or do or pursue something like that. And I actively choose not to because we live in a world where we're constantly being fed messages as black people to disown our blackness in order to really exist um, with full acceptance in the world or more readily accepted. And so that, that statement of all black is really a symbolism of like pride, of reclamation, of saying like, you can try and diminish me and blot me out, but I am still here and I'm still going to just exist as I am. I absolutely love that piece that you just showed us. And I, I, as I've said on the show before, I'm someone with like no visual artistic talent like whatsoever. So I'm always just like extremely impressed and just dumbfounded as to how someone could even go about making something like that visually interesting. So, I, so it, that was just really cool to see for sure. Thanks, David. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I have a random question if we want to circle back around a little bit. Um, you were talking about Ahmad Arbery and uh, his story. Um, so how do you start, how do you go about taking those stories and those feelings and turning them into, into pieces of art? What's that process like? That's a good question too. You guys ask, are asking such fun questions. I'm like excited <laughs> about all of them. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I am very engaged. I sort of have to be because it's part of my job description as like um, somebody working in community and organizing as a as an arts organizer. Um, like I try to be aware of the things that are impacting my neighbors because that means I'm better prepared to respond to them. So I try to keep up with local news and national news um, and, and just stuff like that. And so of course the gram as well like there's so much content just being poured into social media and so much information and I've really tried to curate this the um online spaces I'm existing in to really get the kind of stuff I actually want to see and like hear and learn about and so I had a lot of friends that were sharing Ahmad's story and I've been going to protest since I was like a sophomore in college and I've been thinking about this stuff for so long and it is it's so it's so hard to know like what to like what can I do you know like how can I use what I have to do something meaningful in response to this and not just another like blackout post um but to really make movement and make action um and so that's those were some of the questions I was asking and then I was also asking like why am I making work in my studio um why am I making work to be in galleries? Who are the kind of people that I'm really making work for if that's the space um, where it's happening? So it starts with, it started with those questions. And so then it led to like some preliminary drawings where I just had like a moment. And I was like, there's gonna be like light bulbs and it's gonna be like this, this like deep panel hanging on a wall. And then after George Floyd was murdered, 
I was like, no, we cannot make anything in studios anymore. Like we can't keep making social justice art or whatever. We can't keep making work about the black body to hide in galleries for white people to buy. Like we have to make it so that the people that don't agree with us see it. So that the people that have to see it and would love to see it, but would never walk into Keisha Fine Art or Tugboat Gallery see it. You know what I'm saying? So um, after that moment, I was like, oh man, like screw this. I, I'm done. I'm done making work that's sort of elitist in that way. Uh, at the same time, like it's it's a balance. It's a balance between making the work that's for people and also like trying to survive as an artist. So, yes, long long story short, short yeah. story long. Why do you feel like art is such an uh, effective form of activism? I think it's because it's attractive like we're all having this conversation right now um and part of that is probably because you thought that's attractive i like looking at that and and so it leads you into it it sort of it baits you right it baits all of us we're like oh i like that and then you when you spend time with it it might make you think about things that you wouldn't think about if it was just written like black man is shot in the neighborhood blah 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 like you might not pay attention to that um, but you might pay attention to a mural on the side of a building. Um, so I think it's just another platform to have a conversation that's accessible. And also, if you're not using text, it's readable, um, regardless of the language you speak. So can you talk a little bit more about what you did with uh, South of Downtown or what you do with them and what your job there is like? Yeah. Um, so I came on two years ago and... Um, the vision really when I, I met with Sean before he was my boss was to create a community art space. Um, and that's what we did. We started the South of Downtown Art Hub, which is something uh, Jenna wrote about. And mm -hmm. we've been pursuing just bringing neighbors together through both the creation of community art and murals and creative placemaking, but also through uh, workshops. Like right now we have a fiber series we're doing with a local fiber artist named Leslie Darling. And we have um, like 19 students from the neighborhood and then like 22 students total. And they're all in this room sort of exploring how do you, how do you like dye something, but also how do you use natural materials and like go outside of your home and like pick weeds and make uh, something beautiful out of that. So there's a lot of sort of intersecting goals with the workshops we're teaching. It's like bringing people together, learning a new skill, thinking about something outside of the panic of this moment. Um, and then also thinking about how do we be ecological stewards? How do we think about the natural world even in this dense like urban environment? We still have green space and how do we value that and recognize it's the resources around us? That's really cool. So it's kind of like a all encompassing art centric community space kind of thing. More so we are a geographically based organization. So we're only in two neighborhoods. We're in the near South and Everett neighborhoods. So our goal is to serve that community specifically because it is one of the highest needs uh, areas in the city. We have 5,500 people in this like small area, which in and of itself, you can imagine like there's higher crime because of that population density infrastructure is over a hundred years old in a lot of places so looking at housing quality and affordability um and like try, trying to give people ownership over their community in a place where rent it, like rental like we have a high rental area over 90 percent of people are renting and so we have a high turnover and sort of looking at how do you build community in a place uh where where stability is is um is low if you're like moving so much so that's kind of Art is just a, a way, like one of many sort of vehicles we're using to answer that question. How do you wish to see Lincoln kind of encourage activism and advocate for diversity in within its art scene? So I think I'm really not concerned about diversity in the art scene because the art scene is really just a reflection of the broader community. So the issue isn't like whether or not the art community is diverse or inclusive or representative of the people who are here, but it's a question of 
is our, is our society, is our city, are our organizations representative of the people who are here? Uh, and that's a question I think about a lot, a lot, a lot, because I see like our, our board and our organization and I see um, the committees that are run by our city government and thinking about like who is asked, why are they asked, who isn't asked to be a part of that and why aren't they asked? So I think one thing I'd like to see is sort of greater language inclusion um, just in our city as a whole. Like I would love to see um, arts applications translated into Spanish at minimum. So Kat, thank you again so much for coming onto our, uh, onto our show today. Um, it was, you know, great, fascinating conversation and it was great to learn more about you and your art. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And yeah. uh, this platform is cool. It's cool to see some podcasting happening in Lincoln. Absolutely. That's, you know, that, that's what we're aiming to do. Add, add some more podcasts because podcasts are always, always a good thing. So, um, so yeah, so thank you again and uh, have a great rest of your night. Thank you. Nice to meet you. You too. You too. Okay. Yeah. That was a lot better than actually talking to a cat. I yeah. would not have made for great podcast material. Yeah, man. Yeah. No kidding. Uh, it was great to talk with Kat and she had a lot of great insights and it was great to learn more about her art. So yeah. So yeah. Thanks to her for being on the third ever episode of the Star City Culture Committee. Uh, my name is David Berman. And as always, I am joined by my co-hosts. Jetta Thompson. And Mark Champion. And socks. <laughs> well, till next time, see you around Star City. <laughs>